Hi. In this video, we're going to take our prisoner's dilemma game and apply it to um, an oligopoly market. So in this example, it's very timely. We have two different countries, Saudi Arabia and Iran, that both produce oil. The market for oil in real life is an oligopoly market, and uh, OPEC is a organization that uh, tries to coordinate pricing and production for all of the countries that export oil, uh, all of the OPEC members at least. Uh, and so um, in this example, we're going to take uh, these two countries, we're going to assume some marginal cost uh, for producing oil and some demand for oil, which is you know, completely unrealistic. Um, but then we're going to look at how this uh, market will play out as an oligopoly problem. So you'll remember that in Prisoner's Dilemma, the prisoners, Bonnie and Clyde, they had two options. They could stay silent uh, or they could confess. In this context, when we're talking about firms, they're going to have a choice between colluding, working together with the other firms or other countries in this example, or they can compete with each other. So the best outcome in terms of profit for the entire market will be if the firms work together, if they collude to charge the monopoly price. In order to do that, they're going to have to restrict quantity, right? Reduce quantity, raise prices like a monopoly. But to understand this type of a market, firms basically either have a choice of colluding to behave like a monopoly, or they can compete with each other by lowering their prices, trying to undercut their competitors, and, and therefore capturing a larger share of the market. So we're gonna work this out with numbers, and I'm not actually gonna ask you to do this in the context of oligopoly, but it is a really good review of uh, different market types, right? Uh, especially monopoly problems, uh, which of course you'll need to do on the exam, so I think that'll be useful here. I've just picked two points here, one where they collude and charge the monopoly price, and the other where they, cheer, they charge a, a lower price than the monopoly price. And I've picked 125 because that's the monopoly price, but I've picked 100 sort of randomly as a price that is lower than monopoly. All right, so let's see what happens in this market um, if they charge the monopoly price and if they choose to compete and charge a lower price. So the first thing that I wanna do is, is graph my, my market here. Let me just make that a little bit nicer. I've got demand and marginal revenue, and then I've got marginal cost. And marginal cost in this example is flat across at $50. Right, so marginal cost here is just equal to 50. There's no Q in that function, so no matter what the quantity, marginal cost is 50. That's just a horizontal line across at 50. Then um, we wanna think about what happens um, if the firms behave like a monopoly. So let's go ahead and calculate the monopoly profit maximizing price and quantity in this market. Well, our marginal revenue curve, we're gonna take our demand curve and multiply the slope by two. So our demand's intercept is 200 and the intercept of the marginal revenue line is equal to 100. And then we're gonna set that equal to marginal cost. So we've got 200 minus 2Q is equal to 50. So 150 is equal to 2Q, so our monopoly quantity would be 75. That's this point here, 75. And then to get the price for a monopoly, we would plug that back into demand. So P equals 200 minus 75 would give me a price of 125. You already knew that because I already told you that if the firms behave as a monopoly, they should charge a price of 125. Okay, so 
if they behave as a monopoly, what does that mean about profits? Well, let's go ahead and calculate profit here for the monopoly. That's going to be price times quantity, total revenue, minus total cost will be, now notice here because we have a marginal cost of 50, we can take that marginal cost and just multiply it by our quantity and then add on our fixed cost, which is zero. So that gives me total profit of 5,625. That's not how much each country gets because each country is just half of the market. So we're just gonna assume that if both firms set the same price, they will split the market, okay? They'll get equal numbers of consumers. And if one firm has a lower price, then all of the consumers would like to buy from the low price firm and it will capture the entire market. All right, so we've got our monopoly profits, and then we need to figure out now what happens to profit for these countries if uh, the price is $100. So if the price is $100, what will be the quantity that we sell? Okay, so here we've got price is 100. In that case, the firm would be able to sell Plug that into our demand curve and see how much people want to buy. If the price is 100, they want to buy 100 units. Oops. Okay, so if the firm sets a price of 100, then they'll sell 100 units of gas or oil in this case. And then profits at that point would be 100. dollars times 100 units minus $50 times 100 units, which would give me profit of $5,000. All right, good. So now we can fill in our game matrix. Saudi Arabia and Iran don't know what their competitor will do, if they will set a price of $125 or $100. But they know, um, we know that um, we can fill out the payouts in each of these different cells in the game matrix. So in this cell, um, both firm set a price of 125. So profits, total market profits will be $5,625. They would split them. So each country would get $28,12.50, right? Half of monopoly profits. If they both charge a price of 100, then they're going to sell a smaller sorry, they're gonna sell a larger quantity, right? But their price has gone down and overall they'll make less profit. They would then be splitting that $5,000 and each country would earn, oops, $2,500 in profit. Now, if one country sets a price of $100 and the other sets a price of 125, the country with the cheapest oil is going to sell to the entire market, capturing all $5,000 of profit at a price of 100. So uh, here Saudi Arabia would get $5,000 and Iran would get zero. And then here Iran would get 
$5,000 because they've got the cheaper price and Saudi Arabia would get zero. And the way that we've written out these numbers in our game matrix is exactly the same structure as what we saw in the first prisoner's dilemma example. So when we go to solve this problem from each country's perspective, say Iran doesn't know what Saudi Arabia is going to do, but it knows that if Saudi Arabia colludes, they have an option between $5,000 in profit and $2,800 in profit, they'd like to take 5,000. If Saudi Arabia competes, again, Iran is better off uh, competing. And then if we look at the game from Saudi Arabia's perspective, Saudi Arabia does not know what Iran is gonna do, but if Iran decides to collude, then Saudi Arabia can capture the whole market by competing. And if Iran decides to compete, again, Saudi Arabia is better off competing. 2,500 is bigger than zero. All right, so same thing we saw with Bonnie and Clyde, right? Um, we have each firm has a dominant strategy to compete. And therefore, the Nash equilibrium will occur where both firms compete. And this is a dilemma, right? Because in this situation, each firm will earn $2,500 in profit. However, if they had both agreed to collude, they would have been able to earn a higher profit by setting the monopoly price um, in this market. So what do we know about oligopoly based on this game? Well, in this, in the way that we've described this game as a one-shot game, both countries make one choice and that sets the price in the market. Um, we know that they will always have an incentive to compete with each other. So I would say collusion is difficult at best. Because firms always have an incentive to compete or to undercut their competitors prices. Uh, to capture more of the market for themselves. But by undercutting each other's prices, the firms end up competing with each other, leading to lower profits for all of the firms in the market. Now, this game, this one-shot game, is not very realistic. In reality, um, firms play this game <laughs> over and over and over again, right? They don't just set the price for oil or production levels for oil today, forever. They set the production levels for this month and next month and the next month and the next month, right? Um, and that determines the price this month and the next month and the next month. And these firms are making this, these decisions and they're having this strategic interaction over and over and over again. So that's what we call a repeated game in game theory. We're not going to get too much into this because it's actually very difficult to find the optimal strategy in a repeated game. Prisoner's Dilemma is one of the really classic game theory examples. Um, and it took us a really long time to figure out what the optimal strategy is for a repeated Prisoner's Dilemma game. In fact, um, it wasn't until the 1960s that uh, a bunch of computer scientists got together at a conference. They all wrote computer programs and then had their computers play Prisoner's Dilemma against each other um, kind of over and over and over again. And then they found which strategy would, at the end of the day, yield the highest level of profit. And that strategy, the optimal strategy for a Prisoner's Dilemma game is called tit for tat. 
basically what it means is that the firm or the computer <laughs> or the country begins by cooperating. They begin by, say, colluding to set the monopoly price. Uh, and then after that, they play the strategy that their opponent played in the previous round, right? So assume like round one, I start colluding, but you cheat. Next round, I'm going to cheat. If you begin to collude, I will join you in the next round. Um, and basically, you play whatever your opponent has played in the previous round. So this is the strategy that in a repeated prisoner's dilemma game gives the player the highest uh, payoff after uh, a number of rounds. And what does that tell us about firm behavior in oligopoly markets? Well, it tells us that, uh, that firms may collude, like OPEC, right, to set the monopoly price uh, to form what we call a cartel. A cartel is a group of firms that is uh, colluding, setting the monopoly price. But they will be unstable, right? As soon as one of the firms starts to cheat or compete with the others, then the cartel will likely fall apart. The other firms will begin to compete as well. And that's actually exactly what's happening right now with uh, oil markets um, around the world. So all the news coverage has been very focused on coronavirus and, and rightfully so, but right now um, there is a price war going on in OPEC uh, where Saudi Arabia, uh, well, Russia has lowered their prices for oil or increased their production. Saudi Arabia has followed suit, right? And so oil prices are really, really low right now. Why? Because the cartel has fallen apart and all of the countries are, are in, in essence competing with each other. Uh, so if you, if you are interested, just take you know, 30 seconds, Google oil price war, um, and you'll, you'll get some recent news from the last couple weeks about what's going on in those markets. Okay, uh, the last thing I wanna say here is that the more players that are involved in this game, the more difficult it is to maintain the cartel. So it might be uh, easier for, say, two firms to get together to collude. As we increase the number of firms involved, it becomes much more difficult to, uh, to maintain this monopoly behavior as the incentive to cheat gets larger and larger. Okay, um, so uh, one more note here about this type of behavior, um, which is sometimes called uh, collusion, it's sometimes called um, cartel, it's sometimes called price fixing. Uh, because what has to happen in this situation is that one firm's gotta call another firm and say, hey, raise your, if you raise your prices and I raise my prices, we're both gonna make more money, right? Um, this is illegal, so just, <laughs> Just FYI, I'm not giving you the secret to making a ton of money in business. Um, this, this is illegal. Um, it is not illegal for one firm to observe the prices of another firm and then use that information to set their prices, right? So like gas stations post their prices on big signs. I can look across the street and see what my competitor is charging and then I can, I can charge, um, I can set my price based on what my competitor is charging. However, it is illegal to call my competitor and say, hey, let's both raise our prices. Um, but it, it happens. <laughs> there are lots of examples of price fixing um, happening, um, particularly, like I said, in, in oligopoly markets like airlines, there's a lot of airline antitrust um, enforcement going on. Um, and uh, it is really difficult to prove. Basically, in order to prove that this is happening, one of the people involved in these types of discussions has to rat out everyone else, uh, because otherwise there's not really evidence that price fixing is going on. Um, good. Uh, so uh, hopefully this has helped you understand, right? Again, monopolistic competition and oligopoly are more real world markets. So 
Hopefully you see examples of this in the news or you will um, in the coming years, I'm sure. Uh, this is the end of section three of the course. So go ahead and let me know if you have questions and we're heading into an exam next week. Um, so be sure to check the discussion boards, come to my office hours and I'll see you soon.